Well, good evening, everybody. And good evening, everybody else. You know who you are. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I don't know what it was like for you uh, way out there because this seems very large to me, but the brass from where I was sitting was so rich. Did, did, did you hear it that way? Oh, it was just beautiful. And then our sisters in Christ shared with us that beautiful vocal piece. Uh, I can't help but when I hear music that, that moves me, and it often does. I, I just love music. It is just so incredible to have heart and mind intersect in praise to God. But uh, I'm often reminded of something that I, I feel compelled to share with people, and, and that is that are you aware that according to the Bible, this is astounding, that that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, is himself a songwriter and a vocalist. I mean, that's not implied in Scripture. That is an explicitly stated biblical truth. I'll, I'll just call your attention to it as you're receiving the outline for this evening's message, uh, kind of in passing. Zephaniah 3.17, have you read it? Just very plainly, straight to the point, it says that he, speaking of God, will rejoice over you with singing. Right before that, it says he will quiet you with his love. Who's doing the singing in that text? Who, who's the vocalist there? None other than God himself is the one who is vocalizing his love for you and me in what form? In the form of song. God literally composes lyrics and then sings songs. Do, do you have any idea what that means for our picture of the character of God? This means, my friends, that, that God isn't just a massive energy or force hovering in some distant place or even omnipresent in the universe. God isn't just a, a distant monarch seated on a throne issuing commands with, with no feelings, with no pathos whatsoever. If God is a singer and a songwriter, the implications are that God not only has a mind, God has a heart. God not only thinks, but God feels. And he feels very deeply about you and me. So deeply, in fact, that God spends some of his time actually composing song lyrics and singing over you and me according to Scripture. And uh, just one more little roundabout insight on this, and that is that Scripture says that the Bible itself was inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. You remember Peter said that holy men of old spoke as they were what? What were they? They were moved by the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed how much of Scripture is, in fact, song lyrics? Most immediately, the book of Psalms comes to our mind. David composed those songs, but who inspired them? God did. And then there's the Song of Solomon, of course, one of the most passionate and beautiful love songs ever written. And God, the Holy Spirit, was the inspiration in Solomon's mind drawing forth those beautifully passionate lyrics from Solomon to his Shulamite, to his girlfriend, and then becoming, a, of course, a type of God's love for you and me. So, so God is a singer, my friends. I can't wait until we get into the kingdom. The Bible says, of course, that all flesh from Sabbath to Sabbath will gather before the Lord. Can you imagine perhaps the first Sabbath, definitely some Sabbath in the kingdom? We will receive the bulletins, I suppose, upon entering church service, and can you imagine looking at the program and seeing that the message this Sabbath will be delivered by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sermon will be the cross of Calvary? Can you imagine Jesus himself preaching the cross? Let me tell you what it was like from my perspective, he will say, 
in my thoughts and my feelings. Let me share with you the dark horror of the cross and the bright hope of your salvation that was pulsating inside of me. But then you notice on the program, check this out, not only will Jesus be delivering the message on that Sabbath, some Sabbath, probably many Sabbaths, but you read down in the program and it says that special music will be delivered by God the Father doing a duet with the Holy Spirit with a backup choir of angels. How about that? That is going to be one incredible special music to hear with our ears. The creator of the universe vocalize his love over you and me in song. Let's pray together tonight. Father in heaven, you are so incredibly beautiful and our minds and hearts need desperately to be touched and, and cracked open, Father, to you so that we can see you as you are. Religion can become so mundane and so mechanical, Lord, so formal. Tonight we're asking for something specific. I pray, Father, that you would get into not only our minds, but into our hearts. That you would find passageway into our deep inner feelings, Lord. And that you would draw forth a more intelligent, a more informed, and a more passionate love for you. God, I pray that you would break the power of legalism over our souls and that we would be made free to serve you from our hearts because we want to, not merely, Lord, because we have to. Not with the fear of punishment paramount in our motive, not even with the desire for eternal rewards, Lord, but, but truly because we have seen something of your goodness and love and you have drawn us to yourself, Lord, spontaneously from deep within the inner recesses of our hearts. Help us to fall in love with you a little bit deeper, a little bit more this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have no choice this evening but uh, to share with you in preparation for the message um, a rather personal and private contention that has been going on in my home for years between my wife and I. It's, it's not comfortable at all, but she has leveled an accusation against me and that, that accusation is that, that she, and actually she's pulled my daughters into it. They, they're actually agreeing with her against me. And they have said that for a guy, that is for a male, that I'm kind of weird. <laughs> and the reason why they've leveled this accusation against me makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I think it's unfounded, but the reason why they feel justified in leveling this accusation against me is because, uh, get this, just because I like shopping. That's all. <laughs> that's it. It's the only, that's the only evidence they have. Other than that, there is no evidence whatsoever that I'm weird for a guy. My daughters, as they were growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to take them shopping for clothing. I mean, it was just exhilarating to put them in the dressing room and to go and find all the best stuff, the, the best stuff from a daddy's perspective for his little girls to wear and to take those things to the dressing room, hand it in and have them come out and, and, and just model each piece and for me to be able to have the, the prerogative to say, oh, no, no, that won't do. You are far too beautiful for that. Get that off in a hurry, put on something else, and then finally, finally to say, that's it, right there. That is, that is exactly, you look so great. It's long, it's high, it's wide. That's what you need to be wearing. I, I really like that. By the time they were, I don't know what it was, 12, 13, maybe it was 10, I don't know, they, they, they just said, no more. We're going shopping by ourselves. We'll take mom, but you're not going. 
But the thing I guess that makes it even more unguy-like, more odd, more weird, whatever, is that it's not the clothing store, it's not the boat store, it's not the car store, the tool store, it's not even the snowboard store that I like shopping at the most. My favorite place to shop is the grocery store. Any grocery store will do. I love it. I always want to go. When I'm sitting in the house and I, I catch my wife out of my peripheral vision trying to go grocery shopping without me, I always ask, can I go, please? Can I go? And she always says in a rather emphatic tone, no, I'm in a hurry. My wife shops like a man. She has a very, very clear objective in mind. She has a short list usually way too short for my liking, and she spot shops. She goes into the store and she moves like a pinball throughout the premises, gathering her items, and she is out of the store while I am on aisle two. And she, she always says, no, please don't go with me, Ty, please. I'm in a hurry, I need to just get what we need and get home, and so I, I often am left home alone when it comes to shopping. It is a bummer, I hate it. I wait, I wait, I time her. I think that my wife is, you know, I wouldn't tell her this, please don't tell her this. I think that she knows in her heart that I'm a better shopper than she is. <laughs> and being a woman and all, it bugs her. She, she, she can't handle the fact that I am so methodical. I always go up and down every aisle Consequently, I am a better shopper. I notice things that we need that she doesn't because I have the advantage of the memory trigger. I see everything, so if I see it, I know we need it, I nab it. <laughs> and the best thing about my method is I always discover new things <laughs> that we have never tasted before. <laughs> and some of them have turned out to be really yummy. And uh, she knows this. But, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you specifically though, there was an occasion when uh, my wife was planning to make a, uh, just a great Mexican dinner for us. I just couldn't wait. And uh, she said, I, I was blown away, she, she called out from the kitchen, hey, would you go to the store and get some salsa for us? I thought, I get to go? You're asking me to go? That is so cool. We should make a habit out of this. I'll do the grocery shopping. And so I say, sure, I'll go. And she says, please hurry. I'm almost done. Don't go up and down every aisle. Just walk in the store, go straight to the salsa aisle and get some salsa and get home. Please, Ty, please. And so I go to the store on this occasion determined to prove that I can shop like a man. So I enter the store and I resist the temptation to go up and down the aisles, go straight to the salsa aisle, but there I immediately encounter a problem. There's an obstacle. There is a woman and she is positioned in front of all the salsa. <laughs> this is slowing me down, I know that, but I enter the aisle and I exercise proper grocery store etiquette. I just come up behind her slightly off to, to her left, just allowing proper space. Nobody should ever feel your breath on the back of their neck in a grocery store. So I stand there slightly off to the left behind her and, and she is still gazing forward and I'm just kind of peering over her shoulder, just trying to, you know, gain some time by reading the options so I can get the salsa and get home. And then suddenly out of nowhere, completely unexpectedly, something amazing happened. Out of nowhere, this woman gently reaches back her hand and tenderly clasps mine in hers. <laughs> I say to myself, she's confused. She continues to look forward and then in kind of a breathy, almost romantic tone, she says to me while holding my hand, she says, medium or hot, sweetie pie. <laughs> now the problem is I am, I am in a crisis now. I don't know what to do. Because on the one hand, I know I'm not Sweetie Pie. I'm not him. He is obviously somewhere else in the store looking for good new things up and down the aisles. I'm not him. I know that in my mind. There is integrity at stake here. 
On the other hand, my quandary is that I do have very definite opinions about salsa, and she asked my opinion. So as we stand there holding hands, <laughs> nervous, I might add, so I'm gripping her hand even tighter now. <laughs> I'm trying to decide what to do, and then in slow motion, it did happen that way. Slow motion, as she asks the question, medium or hot, sweetie pie, she is turning toward me in full pucker. And our eyes are about to meet. And I know she's going to just completely freak out upon discovering that I'm not him. So I hold her hand a little tighter. And just as I'm formulating my answer and craning my head back toward the spaghetti sauce, as her lips are coming toward me, I say, actually, ma'am, I prefer mild salsa, and I'm about to explain why. Uh, do you know why? Because mild salsa is the only salsa that you can taste all the subtle fusion of the cilantro and the onions and the tomatoes and the garlic. If it's too hot, if it's too hot, you're not tasting anything. You know, it's like being a smoker for 20 years and then eating strawberries. It doesn't work. And so I'm explaining this to her. I didn't get very far. As soon as our eyes met, she sucked in her pucker lifted my hand in tow from hers, threw my hand from her body as if I had a disease or something, and she ran out of the salsa aisle. No salsa in hand, no doubt looking, searching frantically for her true love, which was fine with me because I was in a hurry. So I grabbed the salsa, and all of a sudden, two things dawn on me. Well, the first thing I was thinking is, well, exactly what you would be thinking. I really hope that Sweetie Pie isn't six foot six of tattoo-covered muscles. You know what I mean? You've seen this guy, haven't you? And that he's searching the store for the twerp that was holding his <laughs> girl's hand. That's the first thing. I'm nervous. I'm really nervous now. I'm rushing to the checkout stand. I'm shopping like my wife now. I come to the checkout stand, I pay for the salsa, I exit the store, and the second thing that's dawning on me is perhaps what has dawned on you. And that is that everybody in the world, in a sense, is in the predicament of that woman in the salsa aisle. Everyone is on the one hand caught up in some love relationship or in the pursuit of one. Everyone is. It is the universal truism of human experience. We're all looking for love. We're all entering relationships and then breaking them off and entering relationships and experiencing the rise and fall of our emotions in those relationships. Even outside of the male-female relationship, we're all in hot pursuit of relationships with all our heart that fall into the category of friendship. I mean, one of the greatest relationships I ever had as a human being was with, was with my grandmother. She was incredible. I loved this lady. She was an amazing person, and I felt absolutely affirmed and accepted by her, and I knew that something on an entirely different scale and a different level was happening in my little boy life every time I was with her for the summer. And then, and then there's my children. Some of you, many of you, maybe most of you have children, and you know what it's like to literally love another human being more than your own existence and to long for what is best and right and true for them. All of us have had friendships as well. And in those friendships, we're hoping, we're hoping for something very specific. We don't enter friendships hoping 
to experience betrayal. We don't enter friendships even expecting oftentimes to be violated, to be spoken about in an ill manner behind our backs and to have that friendship become strained and end. No, no, no. With all our heart, we enter into friendships hoping to experience the, the intimacy of affirmation and acceptance and the security of knowing that we are accepted and loved for who we are by that individual. Something, something very universal is going on inside all human beings. We literally seem to be wired, we seem to be structured in our deep inner identities for love. Literally, by definition, it seems as though we are constructed in such a way that we cannot help but pursue connectedness with others. If we go into isolation, usually due to broken relationships that hurt us very deeply, if we go into isolation, we can't enter isolation without also experiencing loneliness. Isolation is the physical and social proximity of our withdrawal. But loneliness, that's the psychological and emotional place where we end up. It's not possible for us to go into isolation and not somewhere, at least secretly in our hearts, long for that loneliness to be penetrated by somebody who can be trusted. And that is the very nature of loneliness. It's to long for something else, for something different, for something beautiful in a relationship. Why are we like this? I mean, that's the question that begs answer. Because if you think about it, the prevailing model of reality, at least in the West, the prevailing model of reality basically says that you and I, we are merely biological survival machines. That's, that's all we are. And the highest law of our nature is self-preservation. That's it. Biological survival machines who exist to survive. Lead follower, get out of the way because I'm coming through. I'm my favorite person. Look out for number one. The survival of the fittest, natural selection, model of reality basically says you and I are selfishness machines and we will only survive and thrive if we look out for number one. And yet, the way that we emote and the way that we think and rationalize and the way that our wills move and then take our bodies with them seems to indicate another storyline, seems to indicate a different model of reality. I mean, totally against the evolutionary worldview, we seem to be, all of us, rather wired not for self-preservation, but for giving, for service. It seems like actually we thrive and, and, and really move forward in our lives psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, even, as I'll show you in a moment, biologically, that we are better off when we are looking out of ourselves and extending our hearts and our hands to others. We literally become higher quality creatures in that mode of existence, which flies in the face of the evolutionary worldview that says, no, 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 you're an animal and the law of the jungle is the law of your psyche. What's happening on the frontiers of science, however, is throwing the scientific community into a rather disconcerting conundrum. Because over the last 15, 20 years, a body of data has been accumulating that the scientific community at large doesn't know what to do with. They don't know how to handle this, this new data that's been accumulating. I'm giving you one example in the outline that you should have in your hand. And the example I'm giving you is the, uh, the book by Dr. Dean Ornish, 
entitled Love and Survival. How many of you, raise your hand if you are familiar with the name Dr. Dean Ornish. Raise your hand. I thought so many Seventh-day Adventists know Dr. Ornish because he is the researcher and physician who actually demonstrated through controlled studies that heart disease could be reversed by lifestyle changes, specifically through exercise and dietary change, which, which many Seventh-day Adventists, of course, found to be very supportive of a view of health that we have held for a really long time. So Dr. Ornish is, is popular in Adventist circles because of that research. But, but Dr. Ornish has for his first love not the study of the biological heart, but the study of the emotional heart. Long before he began research regarding the reversal of heart disease, Dr. Ornish was accumulating data regarding how it is that human beings intersect with intimacy and love and the effect that intimacy and love has on human beings. And so when he published his book, Love and Survival, I want you to notice the very intentional juxtaposition of those two words. This is a book about love and what? Survival. And the basic thesis of the book is articulated on page 29. Notice what Dr. Ornish says on page 29 of Love and Survival. By the way, went straight to the New York Times bestseller list, has continued to be a bestseller in other languages around the world because the idea itself is so intriguing. Watch his thesis, page 29. Dr. Ornish says, and I quote, anything that promotes feelings of what? What are those two words? Love and what? Intimacy is healing. Anything that promotes feelings of love and intimacy is healing. By the word healing, he is talking about the physiological effect of love and healing on the human being. Anything, he goes on to say, that promotes isolation, separation, loneliness, loss, hostility, anger, cynicism, depression, alienation, and related what? Related feelings often leads to, get this, suffering, disease, and premature death from all causes. In other words, what Dr. Ornish is telling us is that if a human being is physically, biologically predisposed by heredity to some particular ailment, to some particular disease. That's why the physician wants to take from you and me a family, what? History. Because we are predisposed in certain directions. And if we are predisposed to cancer, if we are predisposed to heart disease or osteoporosis or whatever the case may be, listen, Dr. Ornish demonstrates that whatever it is that we are predisposed to, we are more likely to weaken and succumb and die prematurely from that predisposition if we are living in a social relational climate in which there is anger, cynicism, isolation, and related kinds of negative emotional feelings. On the other hand, he demonstrates in his book, and this is fascinating, that love and intimacy, the simple interactions of affection in friendships, actually increases the likelihood of longevity as the body is made able to fight better against anything that we're predisposed to. Of course, he doesn't mean to say that if we live in loving, affectionate relationships that are filled with trust and loyalty and affirmation, he doesn't mean to say you won't ever die. Of course you will. He's saying that you will better be able to fight off any disease because your immune system will be built up and able to fight if you are in a positive social environment. This is incredible information. He goes throughout his book to demonstrate that literally the act of reaching out your hand and giving affectionate touch in a handshake, reaching your hand up and gently squeezing someone's shoulder. I have a friend that every time I see him, there is immediate physical contact. He grabs my right hand, he yanks me to him. Our chests 
bounce. His is bigger than mine. I'm the one doing the bouncing. <laughs> I think he's amusing himself. He holds me in his hand for a moment, and I tell you, I tell you, I look forward to seeing this guy for a multitude of reasons, but the quality of my life rises because of his love and acceptance and the friendship that we share. Dr. Ornish literally proves that the white blood cell count goes up in your body to better fight off disease. The white blood cell count goes up in your body through the simple action of affectionate touch. So just go ahead and touch the person next to you if you should. The person next to you, just touch their hand. Just, does anybody feel their white blood cell count going up? It's not something that you feel, really, but let me just tell you what we just accomplished in that little experiment. Almost all of you smiled, and some of you laughed, and literally the quality of your life was just, to some level, incrementally raised. You didn't think about it very carefully, but you're better off now. <laughs> He proves that the white blood cell count goes up in the body through affectionate touch. I mean, it's the best natural remedy. It's not charcoal. It's not golden seal. It's not hot, hot and cold showers. No, those things are good. But, but listen, I'm going to tell my brothers this. This is a private conversation now between me and my bros. Listen, if you feel a cold, the flu coming on, if you feel cancer coming on, just get with your girl and tell her that you need a natural remedy and you would, like, you would like her to apply the natural remedy by gently, affectionately touching you, holding you. Maybe, maybe a back massage, I don't know. And vice versa, ladies, I can't talk to you like that because I'll blush, but I'll tell you this, there is no better remedy than to enter the presence of somebody who is truly a friend. And that individual just reaches out their hand and says through touch, I like you, and I'm glad you're in my life. Dr. Ornish demonstrates that that's the kind of creatures we are. We are literally hardwired for love. He goes on and he says on page 22, actually looping back from page 29, the scientific evidence, he says, leaves little doubt that love and intimacy are powerful determinants of our health and survival. Now, note the next word after the period. What is that word, everybody? I said, what is that word, everybody? Why, okay? I want you to notice that the word why is italicized. I didn't italicize it. It is italicized in the book. This is Dr. Ornish italicizing, emphasizing the word. He says, there is little doubt. The evidence is in. For some reason, human beings literally are better off biologically, physically, physiologically through love and intimacy. And then he says with emphasis why, why they have such an impact remains somewhat a what? A mystery. The scientific community can't figure this out. And in fact, it's a problem because if the prevailing model of reality is in fact the truth of our origins, then love shouldn't even exist. Because the highest law of that model of reality is self-preservation and survival of the fittest, not giving and loving and serving. Love shouldn't even exist if that model of reality is true. So what happens? The scientific community who hold that model of reality as a given look at this data and they scratch their heads and say, hmm, that's odd. We shouldn't be like that, but for some reason we are. We should be biological survival machines, but the data seems to be saying that rather we are spiritual love machines. And they can't figure it out. So what Dr. Ornish did is he said, okay, okay, we got to figure this out. So we're going to bring the best intellects on the planet to bear upon this problem. And I'm going to interview 22 
of the most highly educated specialists in their various fields, and I'm going to pose one question to them, Ornish says. I'm going to ask them, hey, my research is demonstrating, and lots of other research is demonstrating, that human beings are engineered for love. This is somewhat of a mystery. We don't know why we're like this. And so I have one question for all you experts. Why are we like this? And so he interviewed these 22 different specialists. Notice page 175, quoting from Dr. S. Leonard Syme, Ornish quoting the doctor, and this is what he says. I think that looking at this connection between relationship and survival is the most significant thing that can be done in our field right now. Notice, the most significant branch of science, the most significant thing that can be probed and, and sought after to understand. What, what is the most important field according to this scientist? To somehow try to understand the relationship between survival and relationship with others, intimacy with others. And here's why he says this is important. He goes on and he says, we are in a major crisis. He means the scientific community as a whole is in a major crisis. It's an intellectual crisis. It is a crisis of rational process. Here's the crisis. We have tons of data with no what? with no theory. What's the tons of data he's talking about? Well, at least two tons of it are presented in Ornish's book. Tons of data demonstrating that human beings are literally engineered psychologically, emotionally, and biologically even, that human beings are engineered for love. This is, he says, a mystery. We don't know why. And one of the experts says, yeah, pretty mysterious. We had better figure this out because it is giving us an intellectual crisis because we have tons of data telling us that we are creatures of love rather than survival. And we have no theory to explain why we're, why we're like this. Well, let me just ask you this evening. Does anybody here have a theory? Do you have a theory? Does anybody here have a hunch of why we happen to be like this? Because they're drawing a blank. They're like, whoa, this is crazy. Okay, why are we like this is the question being asked over and over. He says we have no, no overriding conceptual model. We don't even know what to do with this data. Well, on page 179, watch where the rational process inevitably has to go if you assume that there is no creator in the picture of reality. Notice where we have to go in the rational process. Page 171, after interviewing all these various experts, Ornish says, yet mystery remains. No one can fully explain what is going on. That is, why love and intimacy matter so much. Many of these people talk about what? Energy. May the force be with you. In other words, if you remove from your model of reality a very personal God, a God, by the way, who sings, a God who emotes, a God who feels and vocalizes his love, that kind of God, if you remove a personal God from reality, that is, in your perception of reality, the only direction the experts can go is say, well, maybe we're like this because of some, some, what's the word they use? Some energy. Maybe there's some energy out there that's making us like this. Well, check this out. They go a step further because on page 179, John Kabat-Zinn, another researcher interviewed by Dr. Ornish, affirmed that the findings of science are definitely <laughs> indicating that human nature is innately designed for intimacy. Innately designed for intimacy. So Dr. Ornish asks Dr. Kabat-Zinn, intimacy with what? Why, why the question? Intimacy with what? Because what is the prevailing model of reality? There is no what. We're it. Human beings are the pinnacle of reality in the evolutionary process. There is no one, no what, no who beyond us. I mean, intimacy with what? With who? 
Dr. Kabat-Zinn responds the only way he can respond. Notice this answer. Oh, well, ultimately with a sense of self. With who you are, then he says the I, capital I, the I, singular, itself becomes the object of awareness. Dr. Ornish goes a step further <laughs> on page 146 and with no personal God anywhere in the universe to anchor this understanding. And he says on page 146, second to the last quote on page one of your outline, he says, God, so he brings God into the picture, God is not something we attain from out there somewhere. We realize that God, get this, God is in us as us. We understand that this, in this context, the realization of God or of our capital S self by any other name is perhaps the ultimate healing experience. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying that, okay, 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 the data is telling us that we are engineered for love and intimacy and relationship, which of necessity implies connection with someone outside of ourselves. We don't know what to do with this data because in our prevailing model, there is no someone else. So, ultimately, we must need intimacy with ourselves. Just go in the bathroom, look in the mirror, you're it. And I challenge you to strive with all your might to attain intimacy with yourself. Intimacy, by its very definition, looks out of self and lavishes its passion and energies on some other. Human beings are not, according to the data that is accumulating, human beings are not merely biological survival machines, my friends. Human beings are internally crafted by a maker in such a way that you and I survive and not merely survive, we thrive on love and intimacy, not only with one another, but we ultimately find within ourselves a hunger and a yearning for a relationship of faithfulness that transcends every other relationship. Notice that the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, bottom of page one of your outline. Notice very carefully, you know these words, but now you will see these words with new eyes in our context this evening. Notice these words, what may be known of God, Paul says, what may be known of God is manifest where? In them. Who's them? Well, that is in human beings, within human nature itself. There is something within the very fabric of human nature and experience that testifies of God's existence. Now, he, he goes on throughout Romans to give us various different insights regarding what that something is that is literally inscribed within our natures. He says later on in chapter 2 that every human being, even those who don't know God by name, those who don't have the law written on tables of stone as a code of ethics that they can read and mark and underline, those who don't have the law in that form, Paul says in chapter 2 of Romans, nevertheless have the law written in their very hearts and minds so that every time they do wrong, Paul says, their conscience condemns, and every time they do right, their conscience affirms them. He goes on to point out that the prevailing reality of human experience is that we were made to live in such a way that we do no harm to our neighbor, but live in love valuing all others above and before ourselves in chapter 13. He says love is the fulfilling of the law because it does no harm to anybody. 
Over and over again, Paul explains, and Scripture as a whole explains, that human beings literally are made in such a way that God's very existence and his character is testified, what does he say? In them. What may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. So much so that you can be an atheist scientist, gather data, and have the testimony so loud and clear that you can write a book about it and say, check this out. All the data is saying that we're something more than we thought we are. All the data is saying that we are, that we are these lofty, noble creatures that thrive on love. And this is just data. This is just information. Paul says, what may be known of God is made known in them, but he goes a step further. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible, what? Attributes, that is his character traits. That is what makes God who God is at heart. The way God thinks, the way God feels, the way God moves. His attributes, notice Paul says, his attributes are clearly what? Seen, being understood by the things that are made, most specifically, ourselves, made by God in his image. All you have to do is examine human nature and how it operates, and you get at least a suspicion that you were made for an intimacy that transcends all intimacies you've ever known. You keep hungering for something more. You keep running up and down the aisles looking for true love. And you keep running from faces and eyes that don't seem to set right, wishing that you could be loved on a level that you've never been loved before. We're made this way. Page two of your outline gives us in rapid fire succession three one-liners from scripture take these in. Please notice the logic that unfolds in these three sentences of Scripture. Genesis 1:27 simply and profoundly states, God created man, that is mankind, the man and the woman, as a unit, as a social unit. God created the social unit of the man and the woman in his own what? In his own image. This is not a statement about physical appearance. This is a statement about emotional, intellectual, rational, and spiritual structure. This is a statement about how we're engineered psychologically, emotionally, and biologically. We were made to think and to feel and to live like God thinks and feels and lives. And how is that? Scripture number two, 1 John 4, 16. God is what, everybody? God is love. By the way, that is bar none, the absolute most powerful statement that can be uttered by human lips. That is the statement above all statements that is just ram-packed full of explanatory power. If you want to understand reality as it is occurring within your home, within your business, within your nation, within your world, within your solar system, within any relationship, the answer is enfolded in those three words. All of reality is articulated in these three words. God is love. You will notice that this is, my friends, listen, this is the only total identity statement about God in Scripture. The only statement in Scripture, that is, that describes with a single word, and that is a noun, the totality of who and what God is. The only one. It is singular. It is the only total identity statement about God in Scripture. All other statements about God employ adjectives and verbs. This is the only noun that describes the essence of God's core identity. For example, the Bible says God is holy but never holiness. 
The Bible says God is merciful, but never mercy. The Bible never says God is justice. No, but God is just. God is patient, but not patience. Because everything that is true of God is true of God because God is love. Justice, mercy, patience, goodness, holiness, all of it fits within the parameters of the overriding pervasive reality of who and what God is. God is in a very singular noun sense. God is love. And everything else derives from that one reality. So God made mankind the social unit of the man and the woman in his own image. What is that image? God is love. God made human beings in the image of his love, to love like God loves. That is to love with utter and complete self-giving, other-centered passion. You and I, we were made to look out of ourselves, to reach our hands out, to move our feet out, away from ourselves, and to live for others. God created man in his own image, and God, my friends, is love. But now notice this. Make, this. make this transition with me. After the fall of mankind, something happened. Something radical happened within the human psyche. Have you read the book Steps to Christ? Amen. Is it a good book? Amen. You know what I have written in the cover of my Steps to Christ? Remedy for any life crisis. Stop eating food and read this book cover to cover and then resume. Amen. That has nothing to do with the message tonight. Listen, <laughs> listen. In that book, there is a one-liner that so beautifully and clearly articulates the essence of what occurred in the fall, capital F, the fall of mankind. It simply says, in quote marks now, selfishness took the place of love. That's the fall. Having occurred, the fall now has given us all a legacy from the Garden of Eden, a legacy of self-centeredness, a legacy of psychological and, and emotional orientation toward ourselves, which is, by the way, the source of literally, without exaggeration, every problem in our lives. But notice this now, post-fall, God created man in his image. God is love. Post-fall now, Proverbs 19.22, as it is articulated in the New International Version, which is best to the Hebrew here. Notice, what a man, that is what a human being desires, is what? Unfailing love. This is just off the charts, incredible epiphany of understanding if you allow it to register. Literally, Scripture says that every human being universally, every man, woman, and child, doesn't matter who it is, in our honest, sober moments, every human being, if you just come into touch with what's really going on inside of you, every single person, Scripture says, desires unfailing love. That is the biblical diagnosis, if you will, of what's wrong with us. There is this massive void of love. We were made for it, we must have it, or we die. Human beings now, post-fall, after the sin problem, has gripped us by the juggler and is shaking us and throwing us to the ground and trying to destroy us, the sin problem that has so deeply reframed our identity as human beings. That sin problem is summarized in a gnawing absence of love. And Scripture says, you and I, most of the time, unwittingly, with no vocabulary around it, but more on an emotional level, we know it's true. That we desire love, and Scripture says we desire a very specific kind or category or quality of love. Did you catch it? The sentence has love modified by a word. What's the modifying word? 
unfailing love. That is love of a particular kind or quality. This is crucial because the word love, if there's any word that means more than any other and yet has been slaughtered nearly beyond recognition, it's the word love. I mean, think about it. Any given day of the week, just turn on the radio, you'll hear about love within the first few moments. Right? We live in a pop culture filled with the usage of the word love. A popular music magazine a number of years ago did a word search in their massive database of song lyrics. And they discovered that the most frequently used word in pop music is, would you like to guess? Love. Do you know what the second most frequently used word is in popular music? Baby. Not as a synonym for infant either. But as in baby, because you're babable, I love you. That kind of baby, right? Do you want to know what the third most frequently used word is in popular music? It's no surprise. Yeah, as in oh yeah. As in baby, I love you, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's even a group called the yeah, yeah, yeahs. Literally, there's a group by that name. Don't search them out. I don't recommend that. But here's the point. That is the basic content of popular music. It's all about love, and yet, it's not. In a very strange kind of way, the vocabulary has been emasculated. The word doesn't mean what it ought to mean in popular culture. I mean, get any CD or don't, and you will notice on song one, basic lyrical content. I mean, it's much more, you know, poetic than this. I'm just giving an example, but, but song number one, baby, I love you, oh yeah. By the time you get to song three, baby, I don't love you anymore. What happens by track five? Well, I'm in love with another baby. That's why I don't love this baby anymore, because there's a more babable babe that's come along and has gotten my attention. What has just happened in that entire cycle of pop love? What's happened? Essentially, what's happened is that I have defined love in terms of myself, right? I love you to the degree that you are of satisfaction to who? To me. Which if you think about it, and you should, if you think about it, if I love you because of what you do for me, it's not you I really love, it's me I love. It's like the woman in a marriage counseling session who said to me right in front of her husband, and this lady was, she was waxing philosophical. I mean, this was a level of clarity I've never heard in a marriage counseling session. This lady said, I'll tell you what the problem is. I said, please tell me. She said, my husband doesn't love me. He uses me to love himself. I'm like a tool in his shed, she said. So you get the picture. Love, when it is defined in terms of self-gratification, really is not love and definitely not what the Bible means when it says God is love. Are you with me at all? Okay, so God created man in his own what? Image. What is the image of God? God is love. And now post-fall, what is it at the deepest recesses of our souls? What is it that we're really longing for? unfailing love, a particular quality of love that is consistent, loyal, and faithful. Really, we're not interested in broken relationships. <laughs> we're not interested in violation. We're not interested in, in being accepted and, 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 and just doted over, and then all of a sudden the eyes wander and uh, goodbye onto someone else. We're not, we're not really set up psychologically to go through that too many times and not snap. Here's the thing. You and I, we were made for something lofty and great. We're something more than we've ever imagined. And Jesus, in his prayer to the Father, very clearly articulated who and what we are and what we're made for. In John 17 and verse 3, you have it before you. Jesus defined the essence of the life that we are called to share and experience. Jesus said, this is eternal life. So what follows after a th this is statement? A definition, right? Jesus says, I'll tell you what eternal life is. 
This is it. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus does something very, very fascinating here and something very bold because he has just lifted from the Old Testament a word that means matrimonial intimacy. And he has taken that word and he has transported it into the New Testament and given it salvationary significance. The first time the word no occurs in the Bible is in Genesis 4. And Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and brought forth a son. What does it mean Adam knew his wife? Are we talking here about factual knowing? It, does scripture mean Adam contemplated Eve and she got pregnant? Do women get pregnant by being contemplated? No, it's not like science, it's not like math, it's not bi like biolo biology. What kind of knowing is this? It is the intimacy of knowing someone through the giving of the totality of yourself to another. Jesus uses that word, believe it or not, and gives it spiritual significance. And he says, I'll tell you what eternal life is. Eternal life is intimacy with God. Eternal life is a head over heels, nonstop free fall in love with God. Eternal life is not merely a life that is defined in terms of its duration. Jesus didn't say, I'll tell you what eternal life is, it's long. It goes on and on and on forever. It's minutes and hours and days and months. Eternal life is, is I mean, it just, it's, it's lots of life and it keeps going. He didn't define eternal life in terms of its quantity of days, but in terms of its quality, its essence. I mean, if you were to ask me this evening, hey, Ty, uh, you're married, aren't you? I'd say, yes. What's your wife's name? I'd say her name is Sue. Hey, Ty, what's it like being married to Sue? What have I said to you? Well, let me think. Uh, being married, it's long. That's what it's like. It's hours and minutes and days and it just, wow, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> You'd think that I have an ill definition of what marriage is, but listen, I wouldn't say that at all. If you said, hey Ty, what's it like being married to Sue? I would say to you, it's incredible because I have known this girl since she was 13 years old. I was 14, we've been best friends since then. I've been with her longer than I haven't been with her. She is, without question, the best person I've ever known. She was the first person that opened my mind to the possibility of the existence of God. She whispered into my soul as a 13-year-old, hey Ty, God might exist and I think he might like us. I was blown away. It was revolutionary. And over the years, I've been peeling back the layers of her personality and her character. And just literally days ago, stuff came out of her heart through her mouth that revealed to me things about her that made her more beautiful in my eyes. What's it like being married to Sue? I would go on and on and on, but I would never ever speak to you in terms of time. I would never make quantity statements. They would all be quality statements. Jesus says, I'll tell you what eternal life is. Eternal life is to know God. Eternal life is intimacy with God. And then he goes on so that we're not mistaken. He closes his prayer in verses 25 and 26. Do not fail to take this in in the moment that remains. O righteous Father, he closes. The world has not what? Hasn't known you but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me, and I have declared to them your name. And here's the kicker, here's the punchline, here's the bottom line, not only of this prayer, not only of this text, here is the bottom line of your existence and mine. I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, so that the love with which you, Father, have loved me, your eternal Son, in all ages past, that deep place of intimacy that Jesus came from into our world. When in John 1.18, Scripture says he came from the bosom of the Father. That is from deep intimacy and friendship with the Father. 
Jesus says, Father, they don't know you, but I came into this world so that they can, so that they could encounter you through me, so that the love, the very love, Father, with which you have loved me and I have loved you forever and ever, so that the love, get this, my friends, so that the love with which you have loved me may be where? In them. And I in them. Jesus literally frames salvation in terms of you and I being re-inducted into the most blissful and beautiful of all relationships imaginable. He articulates salvation as a complete restoration of relational faithfulness between our souls and God. He says salvation is to know God. And he says salvation is to know his love for you and to love him in return. I mean, dear friends, it is as if all of us are in the grocery store and we are on a mad search up and down the aisles for true love. It's the universal situation. And we come up empty-handed over and over again, even in the best relationships. Because the message this evening is that you and I, we were engineered for an unfailing love that can only be entered into through relationship with the one who made us in his image. You can expect as you engage in that relationship for every area of your life to exponentially rise in quality. Thank you for your time tonight.